like when you applaud at the beginning because I haven't done anything yet. Uh, and I really like to soak that in. Uh, this, I'm visiting from San Francisco, and this is my first time in Philadelphia, and uh, so far it is much nicer than it is portrayed in films. Uh, although all the films I'm referencing are rocky. So no one has hit me in the face. It's been great. Uh, this is a good call. I did actually used to box, so on my agenda is going up those stairs and pretending that I'm really great um, instead of a person who gets their glasses broken a lot. But today I'm going to tell you a couple stories. And a bit of a spoiler here, they're all about me. But they say teach what you know, right? <laughs> and the thing I'm definitely an expert on is me. So. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data. You may have heard of them from the sponsor pitches. Um, I love to write code and talk to people, and I really like to talk about databases, and I love DevOps days because this is the only place where people voluntarily engage in those conversations with me. <laughs> and I want to talk to you all. My Twitter handle is on every slide, not just because I'm a shameless self-promoter, but also because I want to talk to you. And I'm what I like to call an average expert. When you perform on the low end, you tend to get noticed. And when you perform on the high end, you also tend to get noticed. But in the middle is something I like to call good enough. Yo, that's my specialty. <laughs> and it's not just that it's comfortable there, but it's also where most of us live. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Because most of us are just all right. And that's something I've come to embrace in my life. And that probably has a lot to do with my family. I have three older siblings, and they are Truly, some of the most extraordinary people that I have ever known, still. And even my parents had nothing on them. They were these titans. I thought they were great at everything. They were experts in their own areas, and I was just this small sort of afterthought. So there's my sister. This is an accurate drawing I did of her. Uh, and she made it her profile picture, so it must be good or uh, a joke I don't know about. But she was always so fierce and witty, and no one could talk to her like, they, they couldn't talk down to her because she just had this authority that could just like quiet a room. I wish I had now the authority she had when she was 12. <laughs> and she's a high school math teacher these days, so it serves her pretty well. I also have a brother, Jake, who is what I like to call Super cool. He had more friends than I knew were people that existed. We would run into people from, from other schools who I had never, or in other cities, and they would already seem to know each other. He was so popular, and especially when you're young, right? I really envied the, the social grace with which he maneuvered in the world. They all came to worship at the Church of Jake, and I was just amazed by it. And I have another brother, Jared. I visited him in Boston a month ago, and I'm still tired from it because he's the most energetic human on the planet. He does martial arts and Spartan races, and he was always just jumping around, getting everyone excited about whatever he was excited about. And uh, that wasn't really what I did either. Like, I was all right. I read a lot. I read so much. And my sister once said uh, that for the first five or six years of my life, I was essentially a pet, cute but useless. <laughs> I know. But I wondered, well, OK. I, I felt like I was living in this world that was made for them. It was made for these titans who were great at absolutely everything. And it didn't really feel like there was room for me to be great. I felt like I was just waiting for an opportunity to try to be like them. Maybe I could be as smart or as athletic 
or as energetic, but it felt a little bit like, like a lie, like everyone could see that I wasn't really telling the truth. And I mostly shed this, right? I grew up, I got away from those maniacs. And about a year ago, I started working at Influx Data. And I was ready to like write code and talk to people. I was good at those things. And somewhere in my first week, someone said to me, you're going to be attending a lot of DevOps days. And I said, okay. And then I wrote it down in my notebook and then I Googled it for a week because I had never heard of DevOps ever. Ta-da! <laughs> I had certainly uh, never heard of DevOps days. I didn't know what a DevOps engineer was. I didn't know what the practices were. And I ran into a problem when I was trying to research it. So I would just Google, okay, I can do this, right? What is DevOps? And then Google would give me things like, we have the solution to your DevOps problems. <laughs> and I would say like, right, but what is it? What is my problem? Uh, common question. But I was also just getting lists of tools and products, and I found that to be confusing. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'm just coming at this wrong. Maybe I just need to install the tools. I just need to like grab one and say like, I'm just gonna use it and now figure it out. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to install, say, Kafka on your local machine, but okay. It didn't go well. I still didn't understand what the tool was or what it was for. And in the end, I succeeded in feeling like dumber than I started out. <laughs> I was like, somehow by installing this, I know less about myself as a person uh, and also about the tools. And I thought, okay, well, you know what? Maybe this just isn't for me. It's not in the cards, right? I just won't know what DevOps is. But then I ran into this problem where it was my job. So I couldn't just sort of walk away. What I had to do instead was turn to parts of my life that could help me. Because I've certainly seen DevOps uh, in practice, but I didn't know that's what it was called. So I thought, well, maybe I can do something I've done before, which is to try to imitate what I think are the best practices. So when I was about eight, I decided I would dress like my sister. Uh, I was like, don't worry about me, I listened to the Smashing Pumpkins. She was not a fan of this. Um, I just thought maybe if I could style myself after her, then I would have some of what made her great, right? I could stand there and say like, ugh, whatever, which was cool at the time, just trust me. Uh, <laughs> There was, a, there was a lot of that. And my sister and I, one, we fought a lot. And one day, we decided that the way to resolve most of our problems was to split our room in half. We had read a story where two sisters were like, we'll draw a line down the room and we'll just never interact. Um, so we decided, we went to school, and when I came home, she had, she had already split the room in half. And like the very gracious sister she is, she very generously gifted me the top half. And that's when I knew I was never going to do a really good job copying her because she was outthinking me at every step. She's six years older than me, so of course she was. Or I, and she hated me more, so I thought maybe it's just better if I just, I have other options. I'll try to be like Jake because he's super cool. <laughs> I was like, I could be cool. I could play sports. That's what he's good at. No, I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> I have been hit in the face by every kind of sports ball that humankind has made. I wasn't good at any of it, and he was super encouraging. He wanted to teach me. He wanted me to be good at sports so that we could like have more in common. But no matter how hard I tried, I just kept getting hit in the face. So he eventually said to me, I really want you to hang out with me, but I'm worried about you. <laughs> like, me too. Maybe I should do something else. So, lucky for me, that's only two out of three. I got one more brother. He's all right. Um, and, and with my second brother, he's really magnificent in this way where he is passionate. 
and everyone in the room feels it. And I thought, I can do that. Let's do this. I'm ready to get excited. People will know. Um, and that lasted all of maybe five minutes because honestly, that wasn't me either. I tried to take on what I thought made him really spectacular and made people like him. But when I tried to be like him, people would say, what they liked about me were just the parts of him I was copying. So I ran into this issue where when I modeled myself after what I considered to be the best, I found myself really lacking. And through time, I figured out a few things, which is that average does not mean small, and it does not mean irrelevant, and it most definitely does not mean easy. What it does mean is most common. Most of us work at what I would call average companies. I work at Influx. We have maybe 120 employees. We're a startup. That doesn't mean that our customers are small or that our business is small, but what it does mean is that we have some limitations, whether that's resources or time or manpower we can put into research, right? And it's important for us to realize when we go to adopt tech that most of these strategies, all the best and latest DevOps tools and philosophies, they were made by this 1% of companies who have the time and resources to say, you know what, let's take two weeks out and build a tool for this. And I don't know about you, but at a small company like Influx, we're each doing the work of seven people. If I took two weeks to do something, it had better make the company a million dollars. Uh, and I don't even work in sales, so I don't know what would happen there. Just someone would have to really like me, I guess. It's important to realize that we are not the anomalies here. It's those titans who are making things difficult for the rest of us. They're setting the standard that it's really hard to meet. But what we need to do is take what makes them great and adjust it for ourselves. Because we can and do take those DevOps strategies and practices and adopt them because in the reality, these companies invent them, but the rest of us, we're the ones using them and perfecting them. But journeying into DevOps is hard. It's not clear where you should go or like what kind of obstacles there's going to be. There will always be tools that are trying to sell you Right? And saying, I'm the tool for the job. Trust me on this. But if you don't even know what problem you're solving, then how can you know which tool is the right tool? And although there's a, a finish sort of drawn on this slide, just like everyone else has been saying, there's not really any being done with DevOps. There's not like, I have done it, let's move on. There's really just incorporating it and adopting it and knowing that that's going to stay with you and your company. But we have to know where to actually start. So these are some of the things I've learned over my past year at Influx, which is my first year learning DevOps, using the tools, trying to adopt it. And I've sort of boiled it down to a couple fundamentals. And I was very pleased to see that some of the ideas were also in this morning's talks, because that means I'm not wrong. Hey. So, the first thing I think of that makes for successful DevOps practices is insight. And this is really about one question. What is going on? What's going on in my application? What's going on in my data center? What's going on with my sysadmin? These are all good questions to ask, right? Because they allow us to ask important questions about how our system works so that we can adjust. My sister moved out when she was 17 and I was about 11, and it was my first taste of freedom ever. And it was great. Oh, I had my own room. And I basically just went in there and shut the door and was like, no one bother me. I am blossoming. 
Uh, and as my sister likes to remind me, I spent the following year uh, making potions dressed as a wizard. I can't explain to you why I did that, but I can tell you that that was, that was time I needed to like become the Katie of today. But somehow there's just like a wizard in here waiting to be let out. And it was important that I gained insight into myself during that time. Because without it, I wouldn't know what any of the real problems facing me were. And this is the same question that we're trying to ask in tech. What are the problems facing me? What's going on in this system? So the, when I started at Influx, I thought, OK, I'll just I'll try to use the tools that I need to learn, which of course was Influx. I think I've said that too many times now. This is not a product talk, I swear. <laughs> Influx. Um, so I picked something I did know, which was a Rails application, and decided to add this like layer of monitoring. Because it's really great to start with something you do know and incorporate something you don't, so that you have some measure of like what success looks like. So I had this very broken Rails app. I expected its behavior to be weird because I had written it. And I just added in this instrumentation tool, Influx, and there were some interesting things going on. I was able to see the length of the response times. Uh, I could see specifically like which queries were slow, which pages were problematic, uh, which it was a, a site that was basically just for writing blogs, so very hip. And um, I could see that like which parts of my application were causing problems. And I did this in maybe two hours. Um, most of that was me trying to get the app up and running in the first place. But I realized that if I could do this in two hours with the tool I didn't know how to use, then what must a DevOps engineer be able to do with their time? So I would say that when it comes to insight, you should choose tools that help you challenge your assumptions and verify behavior. And if this sounds a little bit like test-driven development, it should. When I learned to code, testing was something I very much hung on to because it allowed me to look farther into the future and ask myself what success looked like. What is the ideal for my team what is the ideal for these operations? If you're looking farther ahead and asking what could go wrong, that's one of the most essential questions in DevOps, I think. And I also think that anytime you have metrics that allow you to understand your app a little better, you're already making huge progress. The second thing I think you need is communication. Because if you're not communicating, Sometimes things can really sneak up on you. And there are a lot of layers of communication, many of which were, were touched on this morning. But think about it. We have person to person, and team to team, and system to system, and then every combination of those that you can imagine. So the way in which we communicate largely determines how successful our DevOps will be. And I think that when it comes to communication, we should choose tools that help us, one, prioritize. And Rin talked about that a lot this morning, which I am very grateful for, because prioritizing is the only way we get things done at these smaller average companies. So on a day-to-day, -day, I do everything from writing code to writing blogs to helping our office manager <laughs> to traveling here to Philadelphia. And it is up to me to prioritize what's the most important obstacle? What do I have to tackle first? I had a teacher that used to ask a question that I have found to be the guiding question for me in tech, which is, what is the next smallest step you can take? And this can be something as simple as knowing that an email is a task that can wait while a DM is urgent. It doesn't always have to be a full-blown tool, but most failures in communication that I have seen 
they stem from people's expectations not being met. And the only way that we can clarify that is through better communication. And the way that we adopt that is highly dependent on your organization. And like other people have said, it's not easy to know. There's no one size fits all, but there is a place to start. And that's just knowing what is the most important thing to your organization or to you or to your team. And then of course, we have empathy. Like we haven't talked about that enough. A couple of people like laughed a little bit, which I feel like means that you're getting empathy right now. You're getting it. Um, I don't think that there is any good communication without empathy. So one of the things I did early on when I was trying to understand DevOps is read the Phoenix Project. It was recommended to me by a coworker, and she's not technical, but she said it helped her understand the philosophies. So I started to read it. And I found myself in this very familiar position of being like, oh, they're just not talking to each other. What's the problem? Like, what, why is this a whole thing? But most of these problems really just revolve around one team not understanding why another team can't get something done on time, right? Or not understanding what it takes from the developers to be able to make a release or not understanding what it takes from the ops side. And empathy just lowers that barrier between the teams. And I find that as soon as you start empathizing with the rest of your team, your own and cross teams, then you start being able to just better adapt for their problems, which is good for everybody. Because small changes can still lead to big incidents. The first time I came home from college, I was pretty excited to show off how cool and like a new person I was. I had been living dorm life and I just thought, no one really understands my angst, but maybe they'll see it just written here when I come home, they'll just know. Uh, and I got out of my car and I saw my brother Jared exiting the house and he had this look in his eye and I knew exactly what he was gonna do, because he had done it many times before. He was going to jump on my back for a piggyback ride. Now, he is about three feet taller than me, but we had done this many times and it's never really been a problem. But as he sort of leaped toward me, I had several realizations. One is that I had just been reading for a year, just, just sitting there, not, not hitting the gym or anything, you know? Uh, and he most definitely had been going to the gym. I could, <laughs> upon closer inspection, see that he was a bit bigger than the last time I'd seen him. And so instead of him landing on my back and us like prancing happily forward, what happened is that he smeared me into the gravel and rode me like a toboggan for 10 yards. <laughs> because some things are hard to test for and easy to miss. So we have to pay attention. We have to use the rest of our skills to prioritize and empathize and say, what could go wrong here? I do want to touch on automation and optimization because I think they're really important parts of successful DevOps, obviously. But for me, during this past year of sort of like getting to know what was important and what wasn't, my attempts to incorporate automation were really unsuccessful. And it wasn't because it's not a great practice, it's because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand my processes well enough to know what was worth automating or what was worth optimizing. And it, I think it's really important when you hit this step to sort of weigh, there's like some kind of law of diminishing returns here where I was trying to automate the, getting the number of blogs written on a WordPress site to just get sent to my boss so he would stop asking me for it. Um, but then WordPress just ate up my life. It just like destroyed me a little bit on the inside, just chewing the shrapnel of WordPress. Mm. And I didn't really get this task done. And although if I had been able to sit down for two weeks and, and figure out like what was going wrong with it, I probably could have done it. But again, I didn't have two weeks. I had limited time and resources here. You can't optimize what you don't understand. And monitoring is not the same thing as improving. And I would argue that you must monitor first before you can improve, because if you don't understand 
which parts you need to pay attention to, then a lot of that will just be time wasted on something that you realize later on didn't need your time or didn't need to be improved or didn't matter at all. Average is typical. It means that on any given day at your company, at mine, if you are at an average company, then things are going pretty good. It means nothing's going wrong. Most entrepreneurs would kill to have an average company, right? It means you're on your way. It doesn't mean you're never going to be one of those sort of titans of industry, but it, it means that you have found like the stable position in which to make yourself successful and to make whatever it is you offer valuable. Average is a really good fit. And <laughs> average means, yeah, good enough. And most of the time, whether it's in tech or whether it's in your life, it turns out that average is still pretty good after all. 